All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is episode 18 of WP Dev Table. Um, we're just a uh, if you haven't heard of us before or seen any of our, our other hangouts, um, we're just a loose roundtable development talk um, where we discuss tools, tips, tricks, just about anything WordPress, um, sometimes Raspberry Pi and other things if you saw, I think it was episode 15. Um, so yeah, I mean we try to broadcast every Monday. We've been doing pretty good this year so far. So um, if you want to stay in the know, just feel free to subscribe us on email. Just go to our website, wpdevtable.com slash subscribe, and you'll get notice every time we're gonna go live. So um, today we wanna introduce Tim Nash. He's the WordPress platform lead and developer advocate at 34sp.com, so word, managed WordPress host over there in the UK. Um, he's also a creator of a, a WP API online course um, and helps organize WordPress leads, which is uh, a WordPress meetup group also over in the UK and a speaker at tons and tons of events <laughs> as well, talking all things advanced WordPress development. So uh, thanks for coming on, Tim. Ah, thanks for having me. Uh, I just want to do the tiny ego boost and say WordPress Leads is the oldest uh, WordPress user group in the United Kingdom. Uh, we beat uh, WordPress London by a whole week. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, it's a feather in the hat, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Every so often, a little dig, because obviously everybody knows London. Leeds, we're not so well known, but a little dig every so often to remind them that we, we are the oldest and therefore, in theory, the most senior. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Great. And uh, Tom, why don't you give us a little brief intro to you? You're, you're in your like little shadow self there. Yeah, I thought it'd be really good to have like the Manhattan skyline in the background, but it really just floods me out. I normally look pale, so being darker might not be that bad of a thing. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, anyway, hey, I'm Tom. I'm the director of WordPress platform services at Alley Interactive. Uh, that title changed since last week, so that's kind of cool. And yeah, that's it. Cool. And yeah. are we um, basically competing on the longest title possible? So yeah, I, 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 I mean, thought I was doing quite well with mine, but you, you've just gone one step further. I've tried to been optimizing it. Um, so on LinkedIn, I take out the of and replace it with a comma, and WordPress gets replaced with a WP. So that makes it quite a bit shorter. <laughs> Why are you optimizing it? For character length. I mean, oh. in LinkedIn, you, you get like that one little headline area, and I don't like making it wrap to a second line. Also, on Twitter profiles, you have a limited length to go and display it in, so I try to make it a little bit shorter. Okay. And I'm Jason, and I help uh, small businesses and agencies basically achieve their goals online using WordPress. Um, so we're excited to have Tim on board. He He's uh, the next in line of our WordPress... Um, WAPI chats. Um, it, the WPAPI is pretty heavy at this point now. For if you haven't heard of it, uh, I'm not sure what rock you've been under, but um, you know, we wanted to kind of bring on people that had different perspectives and different views of it, and and especially people that are really out there being evangelists with it. And uh, we thanked him for coming on board and, and talking to us about it. So, Tim, how did you get into WordPress, and, and I guess where, what were you doing beforehand? Um, so, before I was in, involved in WordPress, I was working as a, in a company where we were building payment systems and online systems, and we came, I came up with this idea that I wanted to run a membership site. I can't even remember what I wanted to run the membership site on. And being a good developer, I immediately went and looked for a suitable platform, and I'd been using Drupal before that. And I couldn't find a decent membership module for Drupal. And I, I found this sort of plugin for, for WordPress. And I started hacking at it and realizing how absolutely terrible it was. And being a good developer, which means that I, I then went, I'm going to write my own, which is the worst thing anybody can ever do. And I ended up selling the uh, membership plugin. It was called Your Members. We went for about six years. We were one of the very first commercial WordPress plugins. A few years ago, we sort of went, mm, this is not actually a market we want to be in anymore. Uh, we were a real company 
offering real support with pro offices and overheads and developers, and we were competing against people who, who didn't have offices, overheads, and any you know insurance and liability and all that. And yeah, so we we sort of moved away, uh, but I never moved away, and I sort of kept kept up with the WordPress community and became even more active when I supposedly retired. Uh, and now I work at a hosting company, but I work specifically on our uh, WordPress platform. So it's quite quite a nice full circle I've come to. And somewhere along that journey, I started dealing with REST APIs. Though, it should be said, not actually the one that's in core initially. I mean, I, I've been working with WordPress and uh, JSON APIs or JSON REST APIs for a good five, six years now. So it's, a, it's this is only the very latest version. And a, Quite nice to see it in core after all. Out of all APIs ever, what is your least favorite API to work with? Oh, I think XML RPC has to sit somewhere up there. <laughs> um, but I, 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 they, there's a special place reserved in my my sort of if I had if I owned Pits of Hell, there would be a special place reserved for SOAP. Um, mainly because when I last had to really deal with it. There wasn't really a PHP module. Now there's a very nice PHP module that will abstract it all away for you. But when I was last dealing with it, it was some years ago, that module either did exist and I didn't know about it, or it just didn't exist. Uh, and SOAP is truly painful. The, the world of REST is wonderful. It's simple. It's easy to use. And that's one of the reasons it's going to hopefully start changing the world and, and even start changing WordPress just a little bit. Yeah, I remember working with SOAP. So when I was a Java developer, and it was a nightmare then. And, <laughs> See, and Java had actual tooling that was designed to use it. Yes, it, it, if, if that's what you want to call it. It was like trying to use a hammer to build a house, you know? So, so you talk a lot at conferences as far as advanced WordPress development goes. Um, you talked on testing and, and other things. Do you plan on presenting anything at this year's conferences? Any conferences this year, and and what would those topics be? Yeah, I mean, I I, I would sort of take a step back and say I, I'm not really doing that, talking that much about advanced topics, just topics that good development cycles and and development workflows that people perhaps wouldn't necessarily have come to if they've come through a scenario where they haven't worked with a develop, big development firms before. So uh, testing is one of those things most people say, oh, I need to have a budget to do. Uh, and you don't need to have a budget, you just, but you do need to have the time and a little bit of resources. And you've got to go and learn these sort of things. But actually, testing can often speed up development considerably. So in theory, reducing the overall budget of a project. Uh, and it's stuff like that which has, a, for years, fascinated me. And I, I do come from a more enterprise background. Uh, that's a new word I've been created, enterprisey. But it, it sums up so much of what of that side of development. Uh, and some of it's good and some of it's terrible. In terms of uh, what talks I'm doing this year, um, there's a few word camp. We've got eight or nine word camps in the UK coming up. Um, to be honest, I'm going to try and put a talk in for all of them. Uh, I'm probably not going to do nine unique talks, but I'm hoping to be doing a couple. Obviously, working for a web hosting company, I'm now involved day in, day out, we're dealing with hacked sites and large-scale DDoS attacks. And security side of WordPress has become something that was before I knew quite a lot about. Now is my day in, day out job for a lot of what I do. So um, I'm going to be doing several talks on how to hit, deal with hacked sites and DDoSing. Um, but I also want to talk to people more about how databases and performance optimization, as well as testing. Um, I genuinely believe integration testing is can be fun. Promise. I really promise it can be fun if done right. Um, and testing gets a bad rap. So I do my best to try and uh, encourage people to test more. I don't even want to ask you how it could be fun because I just don't want to know almost. I, I also don't believe you. Uh, OK, fine. I'm going to ask you. This is me asking. <laughs> Gamification. I mean, <laughs> shiny badges is the way forward. Um, I, no, I, I mean, it, the thing about integration testing is it, it lets you use your imagination ahead of time because you're going to be doing, if you're doing um, test driven development, you're actually writing the tests and therefore writing the spec ahead of time. 
um, which gives you a chance to actually use your imagination in a safe and confined way. So you can start working out the confines of what you're going to be doing ahead of yourself. And it also means that you can do all the silly things, which you're thinking, ah, oh, it would be really cool if we could do X. And you get to sketch them out in your head, and you get to sketch them out in tests, even if you never actually write the code. So you end up writing or plotting some of the most brilliant code you're never going to write. And that, is, nothing else, as an, as an intellectual exercise, is quite good fun. Do you have any... Um, sorry. Yeah, Karen? Do you have any like preferred method of going about writing your tests such that they don't become burdensome and not fun? Oh, I, I wish I, I had the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the best answer is get somebody else to write your tests. Um, <laughs> that sounds fun, yeah. <laughs> Separations, and uh, it's a bit of separations and concerns. Um, one of the problems that I found with uh, talking to development teams is the tendency to, if some, if the test doesn't pass, the immediate reaction is not to check the code, is to check the test. And I, I, everywhere I go, I see the same thing. Or someone will, first of all, check what the test is and how the test is written before they'll go and check the code, which is a really odd thing to think about. You don't, uh, I, I, I trust my code more than I trust the test that I just wrote to test my code. How does that work? Um, but so yeah, separating the tests out themselves, making sure that you keep focus and that you actually start with um, almost uh, human-based tests. So you're basically saying, I am going to the page, I expect this, 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 and this. That can then be written up as a test. It can be initially written up as an integration test, which you gives you broad confines. And then unit tests, to be honest, a lot of developers say, everything has to have coverage with unit tests. I'm not necessarily of that opinion. I think log unit tests are great for testing logic and should be used sparingly, but should be used on critical pieces of logic. Um, I think you can easily get bogged down by trying to test absolutely everything with unit tests. And there's, this, there's a brilliant meme going around on Twitter at the moment, which is a picture of two windows on right angles with uh, open clasp locks on the windows. And the meme is somebody opening one window and then opening the other window, and the locks in the windows open, and they just click and open, but when they try to open it fully, both, both windows sort of hit each other. And the moral of the story is both passed the unit, but two unit tests passed, but no integration tests, because the window doesn't actually open. Yeah, I mean, I came from Ruby on Rails development, and, you know, that's obviously TDD. Um, and for me, at least from my perspective, integration tests are probably more important than unit tests only from the fact of that when clients ask for things, especially like e-com clients or something like that where they have something that's, you know, needs to be tested after there's a feature add or subtract or something like that on the site, they're not going to go and run through all of the tests that they need, whether or not somebody buys something and then they have access to it and, and so on and so forth. And the integration tests are kind of like that safety net, you know. It's it's I, I go to the log, I go to the checkout page, and I can then check out properly. I can log in afterwards, and I'm supposed to see this. Um, and I mean, I have clients, you know, that that I launch things all the time, and they don't necessarily, you know, test fully. They're like, yeah, let's go, let's go, you know. I, I wanna. <laughs> Oh, we, we want it launched. It's good. You know, I'm like, all right. And then a week later, they'll come back and they'll say, uh, this isn't working. I go, yeah, didn't you test it? Nope. So. <laughs> I mean, integration tests are a, a brilliant thing for doing, not just for doing quick fixes. I mean, every time I put, put in a patch, you feel so much more comfortable if you know that you put it in that patch and you've ran your integration test and they come back clean. But um, a good use for them is testing backups. So... Let's say you take daily backups. When was the last time you actually checked your daily backup to make sure that it, it will work and how quickly you could put that daily backup back online? Uh, a better way, potentially, to do the daily backups is to take your backup and then, uh, presuming if you're on some sort of cloud hosting platform, you just fire up a new container, you put on the code from the co that you've got, and then you restore the backup, and then you run in your integration tests. Did they pass? Did they fail? Could they run? If they couldn't run, then there's something wrong. If they don't pass, there's something wrong. It means some data is missing from the backup. So you can use integration tests not just for development. You can use them across the board. 
Have you written any PHP tests for uh, WordPress core? I haven't. Um, or rather, I haven't, ha haven't for any patch that actually then got submitted. Um, gotcha. We, I did say, I, I, I spent a better part of a contributor day completely explaining unit tests, and everybody else who I was sitting there to explain a unit test to, they actually all got their patches in, and I realized at the end of the day that I didn't actually write a single test that actually went into core, even though I helped write all the unit tests so over at them all. Um, I'd like to see less unit tests being associated with patches for WordPress core, just as a, because I think it's a barrier to entry. But I'd love to see a full year integration test suite for the basic features, which we're currently missing. Um, that said, there's plenty of reasons why that doesn't exist, and it would be very hard to do. So it's it's not true uh, because it's someone's gone. Oh no, we can't be bothered. It is genuinely a really hard thing to do. I do have um, a set of integration tests for setting up and running, just making sure that WordPress is up and running and running properly, um, which may be on our company's GitHub page. If it's not, I'll can certainly organize it so that it is on a company's GitHub page, which is basically a set of codeception tests that we run when we create a new container with a new WordPress site. We actually run through a set of integration tests just to make sure that we can log into the admin area, that we can post a, do a post, that we can post a comment. And then we roll it back before we give it out to a client. So we always know that the client's website's actually fully working before uh, they come along and actually start using it, which is quite handy. Hmm. It also means we can all, normally run those tests and find out, be, even when um, the site may be saying a server 200, we can actually normally find out, actually, we've just ran these tests and we're getting no data back on several points. So we know that actually your site does have an error somewhere, even though the, the server's returning a 200, which is, again, quite useful. Hmm. So these are like fresh WordPress installs, yeah? Um, yep, though the, we, have a, we have several groupings. So one's for a fresh install. Um, and then you can have a set. We have a second grouping that use more generic tests to the things like that go into the login page, which, unless you're running a particularly weird set of combinations of plugins, will still act in the same way. And we're logging into the dashboard, which should react in the same way. Uh, there are times where these tests will fail. Um, for example, if they've got a, a two-factor authentication on, then which they should do, and we really would encourage them to do, but. Um, Let's face it, not everybody does. Uh, but in that scenario, we perhaps wouldn't be able to log in. But generally, as long as their plugins aren't t interfering, we can actually run most of the suites, even on sites that have been quite heavily customized. And you still use code deception? That, that's your... your... It's, it's my personal choice one. Um, there are plenty of others out there. Uh, the only reason I use Codeception is that it's uh, PHP-based, and it's... It actually acts and tr is true. It lets you write code, or it lets somebody write code as a tester who can just write an almost human readable level of rules and tests. But it lets me, as a developer, take a much more OO approach and I can sort of bring different classes in, etc. So it allows me to intermix with other testers who might have a very low understanding of programming as well as being able to effectively be a power, te power test user. How cool is that? Uh, a power test user. I told you, it's fun. It's gamification. It will work every time. <laughs> so, the, so the REST API, I mean, you, you created a course all around that at this point, um, and it seems pretty in-depth, at least from the syllabus. Um, what, what's... I guess, why why did you want to go down that route as far as the REST API goes? Um, so when I started doing the course, it was uh, a few months ago, and nobody else was doing one. And the information that was out there was sketchy as anything. I mean, um, one thing that was, the REST API hasn't been brilliant at is documentation, which is a shame because... Um, it is actually a well-documented API on, uh, on the underside. And this is not, this is something that, you know, we can all contribute and help with, but it's very hard to get that documentation in place until the REST API is stabled out a bit more, which is the reasoning why. So I was basically taking snippets of information, and I realized I had enough uh, content to put together a course, and uh, my initial plan was actually to give away everything for free and just 
run a course, or even just put it back in as documentation. Uh, and then uh, the missus reminded me that we have a baby, and it might be a good idea if we fed, you know, if we could feed the baby. <laughs> I don't know why she thought this. Um, so she, she actually suggested turning it into a video course. Uh, I grumbled a lot and then went ahead and did it. Um, and while the take-up's not been massive, I've not been massively promoting it either because uh, first off, the I, I, I changed jobs midway through, which was a bit awkward. But also, it, there were several other people who have subsequently come out with stuff, and there's lots of white papers. And uh, I know Josh was on last week, and he's got his video course coming soon, etc. So there seems to be a, a, a huge amount of information suddenly coming out, and I'm sort of looking at it and going, one of the things I've got to do this month is refresh most of this course because it, I started recording it in July, um, well before it was actually in the core, and the amount of times now I have little notes that say this has changed. This is no longer with this, uh, and and uh, I mean for this weekend I've got to to finish off a video which redoes OAuth one plugin as it's completely different now. I was just like, <laughs> just stop developing stuff. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Carry on developing stuff, but don't do it in a way that breaks my course. Uh, so are all the videos done for the course at this point? No, um, there are actually two videos still outstanding. Um, which are a couple of the more larger tutorials. Then they're done in the, the the contents there, and it's just not done as in I haven't I haven't actually finished producing them, which is to my great shame uh, and something I need to sort out. Unfortunately, I needed to move a lot of stuff over at the same time, so there was a big hiatus and a pause in December. So I did restarted the videos in January. Once those two videos are out, then it, I'm basically going to go back to the beginning again and re-record them all. And I think this is the way it's going to be. I think it's for a little while anyway. It's going to be a bit of a living document until things ease off and get a little better. Um, I.e., we stop developing stuff for the REST API. Is the course delivered via like a learning management system? Are there questions or chapters that kind of deal? Um, yeah. So it's, I'm using uh, Woo Theme Sensei. So each each section is a uh, a module in Sensei, and basically it's two or three video lessons, and some extra resources. Uh, normally a bonus lesson that is supposed to be not video content, but is and tangentially connected. So things like webhooks. There's a thing on using press hooks in there. There's bits about uh, using API management services and things like that. I haven't gone down the route of having sort of uh, a question and answer section uh, where you sort of like, you must complete these questions to move on to the next chapter. Mainly because I didn't really know if that was A, something people would want, and B, what level to pitch that at. Uh, it is something that's been asked for, though. Someone's like, I don't know if I'm doing well. And it's like, well, really, I can't, you know, me giving you a bunch of questions isn't going to help you not knowing if you're doing well. How about going out and doing something with it? And I mean, that's the big thing. I'm trying desperately to make sure that it's... there's a, Every lesson has takeaway stuff that you can just take and just start using. Um, hopefully, it's adding value to people, and people are finding it useful. On the whole, people have been very positive. I think I've, out of the whole time, I've only had to issue one refund, and I'm pretty sure the guy didn't know he was actually signing up for a REST API course. I think he might have been ordering a takeaway. But who knows? Takeaway is like food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a reference to pizza in the "Why I Want My Refund," and I was just like, I don't understand, but I'm quite happy to give you a refund. <laughs> Clearly, this isn't a problem. Um, and yeah, I'm, but genuinely, I'm hoping people are finding it useful. And ultimately, the goal is, when I started the REST API course, my intention was actually to do a WPCLI course straight immediately afterwards, to the point that it's all filmed. I've just not had time to edit and sort it. I think what I'm going to end up doing is actually doing the WPCLI course and just giving it away for free. Because, um, uh, yeah, I think I actually found, I'm, the whole idea of not doing, the, of selling the course has actually turned out to be incredibly stressful and uh, it means that well, well, it's good that there's lots of pressure to get things done. That pressure is sort of there, and things aren't done on time. And you always you're sitting there. Now I feel that I'm I'm responsible, and I have to maintain this uh, course forever. Um, 
and as I say, I, that's a brilliant until I realise that they keep changing the REST API forever could be a very long time. So do you think this is maybe just laziness because now you're comfortable in knowing that your baby's going to get fed since you've moved to a full-time position? Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, if I was still if I was still using this as my main income, then um, no, all of this this conversation would be very different. There'd be a lot more buy my courses involved. <laughs> so one other thing I think would be really great to have a course on is the WP Media Library, because as far as just documentation itself goes via the Googles, as well as inline documentation, there seems to be very little. And I know that there's more documentation now than there has been in the past but it's still very unencompassing and it's kind of a nightmare trying to go and implement your own custom uh, media modal dialogues and that kind of stuff so that's something I think would add a lot of value to the community. I mean I think the media library is some sort of dark and strange world for most people <laughs> um, it, it can't, where stuff just happens and obviously especially when you uh, consider that most of them will. Uh, this is what happens when you do include things. Most of them will never have come across the backbone library, or and the whole thing just is so almost a different beast to the rest of WordPress. So I think I can understand why people get confused. I'm not sure I'm the right person to do that course, but it would be a. Real, I'd actually, I think I'd be quite keen on that. Uh, when you when you release that, um, let me know because I might sign up. Yeah, I think Tom volunteered himself at this point. I think so. I think that's it. <laughs> so you better get cracking. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been banging on it for like the last month, month and a half or so, and uh, the radiators are turning on, so you might hear some banging in the background. But uh, it's been fun once you get something working with it, but I feel like you end up spending a very significant amount of time just like punching code and being frustrated and trying to get anything to render on your page. And then it finally happens and you zoom through the other, you know, 90% right away. But I think as as WordPress becomes more heavy on the backbone and that type of stuff, we'll have more general documentation on how to use that in WordPress and people will just be more knowledgeable in using those technologies to build their WordPress solutions. But <coughs> Right now, I think a lot of WordPress developers haven't had a need for doing it, so they just haven't. Yeah. Tim, so you said that your 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 daily, I guess, tasks with 34 SP is is a lot on DDoS and security and that kind of stuff. Do you do you think that the community itself kind of needs to understand those aspects of WordPress better? Because I mean, for the vast majority of the people out there, they don't even think about it. They just down, you know, they just install WordPress on GoDaddy and, and be done with it. Yeah, I think it's um, one that's becoming more to the fore. I think people are starting to realize the security implications a little bit more uh, and, and how that affects them. I think most people are now, if you've been in the industry for a couple of years, have had to at least deal with a hacked site if you haven't actually had a hacked site. And denial of service tax are becoming the norm uh, to great frustration. To give you an idea of how much of, to the norm they are, um, you've just sent me a DM going, your site's down, Tim, and I'm going, yeah, it's being DDoSed. Annoyingly, because I don't host with 34SP. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like, like to use that as my excuse. No, I, I actually have a little Atom box in uh, OVH in France, but uh, yes, it's currently being DDoSed. So my site is down. And this is an example of a really frustrating part of security aspect in that there is absolutely me as a customer, can, I can't do anything about that. Um, their, their routers are going to be overwhelmed for a little bit of time. They've managed to get enough packets to my server that my server keeps falling over and more bad traffic keeps hitting it. Um, that's life. I mean, we can do things. We, we can actually spend money on security, which would be a nice start. Uh, we can stop with try, and we can educate people because there is a lot of quack out there. Um, I, the number of times I'll go onto a website and go, oh look, you've got five security plugins. Do you think they all work together? Really? Do you honestly think that they're all doing good things? Um, there are some good companies out there. There are some terrible ones. 
and there's some intermediaries. As web hosts, we we can do quite a lot. Um, whether that's you actually having proper web application firewalls in place, so things like mod security, uh, whether that's configuring our, our systems to use things like fail to ban, but doing it at a network level or at least at host level, um, to make sure that IPs are suitably thrown into a dark, dark pit when they do bad things. These are all good things, but ultimately, uh, most WordPress vulnerabilities are down to simple stuff like people having passwords like password, and people having administrator users for absolutely every user they and then wondering why when Jimmy got upset one day and took out your site, what, how he could do it. Well, it's because he was an administrator. So there are basic principles that could be applied to any site, and anybody can be taught them. And then there are things that good web hosts will do. And then there's a, a range of plugins out there that will uh, also assist as well. But the most simplest thing, and a, a tip that if you're not doing it already, two-factor authentication, enable it on your admin area. It will take you 10 seconds. Download an app for your phone. Just just go do it. Um, this will this will stop most of the nasty hacks per se, assuming that you're not running some sort of e-commerce solution or something where users require a login. Um, you can block a lot of attacks just simply by having a nice mind space. And obviously, there's also stuff like running over SSL to make sure that your forms are encrypted. But those are very minor. That's not going to stop you getting hacked. That's just good manners. How do, how do you convey to your the clients? I mean. Uh, do you have enterprise level clients, or is this kind of just the mom and pop pizza place? Uh, kind of stuff? We have uh, uh, the biggest range of clients you'll ever meet. We have some pretty huge people, um, and then we have not only mom and pops, but mom and pops grandma, who has a knitting uh, knitting circles website. We also do a lot of work with uh, charities and NGOs. So, um, and those charities can be very, very small local ones through to big international charities and NGOs. So again, with the education range has to go from, hey, this is your website. Do you remember your website? You signed up a few years ago. Now it's hacked. Here, let us explain how we're going to solve this for you and explain how you shouldn't have this happening to um, trying to explain to, to large corporates that really they need to do this sort of information governance and information security internally. Uh, and this is actually a uh, an issue with, that they need to take up at the corporate level, not just with their website owners, because um, you have to breed into this sort of culture. And if you don't, it, it's not going to work. If we just sort of try and turn up with a stick and say, you must do this, it's not going to work unless there's somebody inside the company that's saying, yeah, actually, we get this. It's really bad if our site gets hacked, and the answer is yes. It's really, really bad if your site gets hacked. There's one type of spamming that I found to be quite effective, and I just encountered it probably within the last two months or so, and it, it was common spamming. So you go and fire off a whole bunch of AJAX requests that are going and submitting these comments to the database. And what I thought was neat about that was that it can go and get around your caching, right? Because it doesn't matter how heavily cached your site is, it has to do a database, right? So if you go and flood the servers with a whole bunch of writes like that, it seemed to be a pretty effective way of uh, taking down whatever you needed to. Yeah, I mean, the other one is to go against things like um, XML RPC. Uh, so the XML-RPC.php, uh, that will almost certainly not be cached because uh, XML RPC is all done over post requests. And so the, and the way that the spec is written, it's very difficult to tell a good XML RPC packet from a bad one. Um, as long as it has XML, XML tag in it, it's good. doesn't matter how big the packet is, it's still good. Um, hence why an awful lot of the current DDoS attacks tend to be aimed towards trying to abuse that endpoint. And that's a really quick and effective way to take down a WordPress site because the way the code's written, it loads in an awful lot of stuff. So, and as I say, there is absolutely no caching going on it. We do run things like, um, uh, certainly 34 SP, we, we, we're, we're looking at range of mitigation systems and we do things like fail to ban to try and catch when a repeat offender tries and hits with lots of uh, requests to uh, an endpoint. But it's really difficult to actually 
spot a good and a bad packet because there are times where a plugin like Jetpack may want to make lots of requests simultaneously. And the last thing we want to do is bl both uh, block those requests going through and more importantly, suddenly block automatic from ever talking to any of our, our clients. They might get a bit upset and our clients certainly would get a bit upset. Totally. So I guess <clears throat> as far as from a web host perspective, how much how much education, I guess, from a, to your clients do you feel is kind of the responsibility of the web host to handle some of the, I guess, the, the hosting aspects of it? Because a lot of hosts out there don't, and I'm curious your thoughts on that. It, it's a hard one. I mean, when should a, a web host manage, fix the hack? I mean, if it's denial of service, then that probably means that uh, the infrastructure is being flooded and the host does have a responsibility to manage the infrastructure and try and protect it as much as possible. But if you've uploaded a plugin that has some a, a, a XSS exploit on it or uh, some, some, some form of uh, SQL injection or something similar, is it the host's problem? Um, now we take the, the very much the view that yes it is, in that your host currently you have a problem and we can want to solve that problem for you and we'll try and fix it as quickly as possible albeit that our fix may be to go and find a good backup and then put it over the top losing whatever you've got in between um, ultimately we all have to take some responsibility though even when it's things like denial of service we have to at least expect that these things occur and believe that people are going to try their best to fix things uh, you'll be amazed the number of people who, when something goes horribly wrong, assume that nobody is doing anything about it, even when you're frantically trying to do things. And normally when there is big outages or big problems, be them with something like denial of service or uh, just before Christmas we had a problem with mail servers, and you wouldn't believe the number of people who would, on social media, would be shouting and screaming and telling us how, why don't we work overtime, etc., etc., and where they're going, well, you think we don't do this? You think that we're not trying? Um, but they weren't taking that necessarily the responsibilities for as, as part of that themselves, and they were just solely blaming the host. There's got to be a balancing act somewhere in between. Um, with security, I think everybody can take good precautions, and you have to assume that your host isn't going to be able to fix everything every time. I'm sure most hosts would like to be able to, though. And they are generally normally the good guys, as long as you're paying them more than you know 50p a month. The even low-end hosting companies tend to be quite proactive, and they don't want to hack sites because hack sites are bad for them. The last thing they want is a hack site which joins a botnet which starts DDoSing other companies, because then they get their IPs blocked. Then they get themselves they have to go through heaps and heaps and hoops to get things resolved. So they don't want hack sites. You don't want hack sites to work together, um, but education, education, education. To what Ending extent? Rent. <laughs> to what extent do you expose tools to your customers to allow them to do things themselves, like WPCLI uh, using hooks in Git, that kind of stuff? I mean, so uh, we are WordPress managed hosting. Uh, it's got all BPS based, so it's all containerized. Um, you can have access to WBCLI. It's installed, pre-installed. It's set up and configured for uh, their SSH users. Should they want to use it, uh, we have Git installed. We have a deployment system that's I can't remember what the state of the deployment system is. I've just launched as in it launched this morning, or it's launching next week, um, which also uses the same deployment uses Git as part of that. But we have Git just installed, so you can just use Git as you'd like. Um, we have other tooling in there. So, for example, Composer is on by default. Uh, and we also allow you to turn xDebug on and off on your production server, which is something that we talked about at length because obviously xDebug comes with both. For those of you who don't know, xDebug is a profiling tool which allows you to get full stack traces for PHP, which is fantastic. It's like the most amazing thing ever when you can actually turn on something and go, oh, look, that's where the error is. Not, in the random, not where the error was last mentioned, but the actual error where it started. Stack traces. It's the future. 
<laughs> says the person who was thinking, I'm pretty sure I was doing stack traces in the 80s, but never mind. Um, but yeah, stack traces and being able to do remote debugging and all sorts of other cool stuff and lots of profiling, it's all very good, but you don't want it running on a production site normally. Uh, we offer staging sites at, just with one click, so you can now one click a staging site and then you can say turn on X debug and you can choose to have it on production or staging. If you try to put it on production, we obviously do do the usual, are you sure you want to do this? sort of mentality. Um, I think we're pretty good actually when it comes to what tools we offer people. I don't see a reason why you wouldn't be very good. And I mean plenty of other, uh, we're not doing anything that's unique. Plenty of the other hosts are doing this as well. Um, and it's becoming more of the way to do this. Uh, where I think we are slightly more unique is that we don't have a shared hosting option for our WordPress platform. Uh, so our managed WordPress platform is entirely VPS or containerized. Uh, we use a, a virtualization product called OpenVZ. So it's uh, it's like Docker, but from like 20 years ago. <laughs> OK. Uh, it, it, it is pretty much an industry standard. Yeah. <laughs> so we haven't gone quite that weird. But uh, I mean, th yeah, we like having tools like uh, Docker and to a certain extent Vagrant. I mean, one of the midterms plans is to simply offer our current hosting uh, but available as a Vagrant install, so you can have exactly our local inst uh, how our, how our hosting is set up on your Vagrant install, which was sort of the point of Vagrant in the first place. Before it sort of got everybody went, oh VVV, it looks wonderful and shiny, it has all these wonderful features, but acts and behaves nothing like my production server. So, what kind of caching layers do you support out of the box? Like, do you have Akamai, uh, memcached? Yeah, so we've we've got memcached running on all on your inside your container. Um, up until really recently, we had varnish running inside your container. We've actually removed varnish and replaced it with nginx fast CGI cache, uh, which when we did, a load of people went, "You what now?" Um, but we had really good reasons for it, and basically, with the sort of sites that tend to be using our managed WordPress platform. Uh, which are typical WordPress sites, whether they're e-commerce or, or large, uh, using it as a CMS, they, we saw that it's similar sort of performance levels between using FastCGI cache on Nginx and Varnish. But the FastCGI cache came with a much simpler interface for us to be able to manage and maintain and provision for people, and with a significant resource, less resources than managing and maintaining a Varnish install sitting inside their container. Um, so we actually took the decision, why are we doing this? We're just using up their resources when we could be using, we could give them extra resources for their PHP FBM workers or whatever. So we took it, we've taken out Varnish and touch wood, this seems to be like a good decision. Uh, that's not to say Varnish is bad, it's, it's really good. Uh, it's particularly good for what would be the vast majority of our competitors who are still using shared hosts, where they have lots of hosts so lots of sites on a single host container without any virtualization, and then they put Varnish in front of that. So lots of the sites are then touching individual Varnish, and then they're going to the terminal endpoints. Uh, and in that scenario, it works out quite neatly. But for us, we were actually adding resources um, when we didn't need to, so we're taking it out. Uh, and then in addition to that, people are welcome. We don't actually do we support a CDN. We don't really support a CDN other than we provide an origin server and say, pick your own CDN. So if you do want to put your static assets onto a CDN, you can use an origin server. And we also have a one-click uh, button to en enable Cloudflare if you wanted to go down that route. Um, and basically, the one-click then says, click, and then says, change your name servers to Cloudflare. But we also provide all the interactions and bits. And we're peered with Cloudflare. Um, so it, in theory, is super, super, super fast. So one question I have, because I've seen this occur a few times with other hosts, is these like one-click staging installs, it literally copies everything over. So someone will go and have their Jetpack token exist in two places now. And if they go and make changes between those, then they disconnect the Jetpack from their production site, for example. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really hard problem to solve. Because what, what data should go over, what data shouldn't go over. So the way we do it is that when you click um, create staging the first time, we do do that. We just create a V, uh, well, equivalent of a V host in NGX, so a new location bit. And then we um, copy everything over, and then we use WPCLI to do search and replace through 
for the name, for both the names and the URLs. Uh, and at that point, we don't do anything else. However, when we're moving data backwards and forwards, you have the option to either move uh, plugins, plugins, all files, and then the database. So you can move the database independently. Um, that doesn't actually help too much, but it does give you the ability to at least, you're not copying everything all the, in one direction, everything in the other direction. You can be a bit more selective after the initial install. But yeah, going in and actually being able to make sure that only certain tokens get moved over and certain tokens don't is really difficult. However, see if I can find it. I did find, I will, uh, you guys do show notes, don't you? Mm -hmm. There's a, a really neat little plugin that does um, option groups that allows you to push option groups in your config file. So you can say these com this config file, which you can add into your Adobe uh, config, where you can just say, this stuff data, I want to be pushed over here. I want to push this over there. And it also allows a little bit of versioning for configs, uh, I, which I had a little bit of play with a couple of weeks ago. And its name is completely out of my head, but I will give it to you, and you can put it in the show notes that you could use alongside our uh, staging or anybody else's staging to handle some of those issues, but it still doesn't solve it all. Uh, unfortunately, version control on databases, um, and particularly version control when you're actually trying to do multiple versions, is really complicated. And if you find a good answer, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> sure. Uh, are any of your clients running PHP 5.2? Uh, no. Good. <laughs> I said that, and then I went, there might be some on a dedicated server somewhere that they're technically out of our purview. But no, um, I believe we, as standard, are on 5.5 for our normal clients and for the uh, for WordPress hosting 5.6. Um, usual next question is, are we, gonna pl are we planning to go to PHP 7? The answer is yes, but um, you would be insane to run PHP 7 in production at the moment unless you really know what you're doing, and more importantly, how little... Um, ooh, I this load of echo coming back on there. Um, yeah, you'd be pretty insane to be running PHP 7 in production unless you have a very limited set of modules and extensions that you need, and, and you really know what you're doing. However, we expect to be running PHP 7 fairly soon. Um, I, I suggested that when we got to, when it got to about 7.06, we would have another re-evaluation based on the number of security patches they've put out. That actually might be next week if I'm not careful. Yeah, I think maybe it was a week or two ago, I think someone mentioned to me that PHP uh, 7 has an issue with Peclamem Cache D, which yeah. would kind of be a, a you know game breaker for any sizable site. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty. I mean, modules and uh, extensions, both for um, Peckle ones and just general extensions, are being updated, but... It's new, shiny technology. Obviously, everybody's quite keen to get it as soon as possible, and it does have massive speed improvements. Uh, we also don't run HHVM, which is odd because I was and have been a massive advocate for HHVM and Hack. But there again, it's something where, for the vast majority of people, HHVM is going to well provide speed improvements, will make their life a misery if they want an unusual module. Um, I don't actually think HHVM supports the SOAP module, for example. Oh, that's a massive loss, but um, and certainly I don't think the PHP 7 does at the moment. Though actually, that sounds like the sort of thing that they probably do first before fixing memcache. Uh, I mean, the big thing for me about PHP 7 was that um, one of the lead uh, developers said, "Let's ship it anyway, even though we know it's got this major bug because no one installs point uh, zero releases," which I feel somehow undermined the entire process and my belief in the, the stability of a product, which we're, when they're releasing something, saying no one's going to install a point zero release. Um, so yeah, we'll wait a bit, and then, but it is so much faster. All the tests we've done show it's gonna be, make significant changes and speed up sites significantly, especially ones that are e-commerce based where actually caching is of limited uh, use. So do you guys have global data centers, or is it all kind of local? No, we, um, we're quite really, we're a bit bizarre, because um, a lot of our customers actually really like the fact we're, uh, so we're ma based in Manchester, which is in the north of the UK, um, and we're, we're based in one Manchester data center. Uh, it's all our own hardware and infrastructure, 
that doesn't we're only doing that because that's what we've done in the past and at the moment it's still cost effective for us to buy our own hardware um, if we were starting a web hosting company today it probably wouldn't be cost effective to own your own hardware you're probably better off using some sort of cloud solution and there's going to become a point where it's not going to be cost effective enough for us to do that and we're going to be going bye bye to the data center it's not yet it's not going to be for a few years um, but at the current rate it, it's it, we won't own our own hardware for very much longer well we do we're milking it because um, it's really good that we know uh, we can get access to the hardware and when we have fault we can fix it and we're the people responsible for fixing it there's nothing worse than sitting and going yes we, I'm, I apologize I know it's out but it's, I can't fix it I can't make it go any faster I can't solve this problem whereas we, we at least are in complete control of the entire stack and it's a small jab to a couple of our competitors it also means that we know which countries we're in uh, one of our competitors proudly announced that they uh, they just opened their first UK data center it turned out they were on AWS, and their new data center was in uh, Dublin, which is actually in the Republic of Ireland, not in the United Kingdom. They could, we weren't quite sure who was going to be more upset, Brits or Irish, and then we remembered most definitely the Irish. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think you're leaving, your company is leaving money on the table by not having data centers where your potential customers are? Because for me, and some of the clients that I work with, one of the requirements would definitely be that there's a data center located somewhere around where the majority of the population that's viewing that site is. I mean, I, to be fair, the vast majority of our customers are British, um, and the vast majority of their visitors are in the UK, so and we're not a hugely populous, well, we're a hugely populous country, we're not particularly large companies, a uh, large country, so actually there really are only three or four major data data terminuses in the UK we happen to be in one of them uh, but I know what you mean uh, the advantage for us really is that as a company we're relatively small um, but we have UK support teams that are purely in the UK everybody works in the same office and in the same data centers in the same data center so we we know what we're doing we know where we are um, we used to have a data center down in London as well, or rather racks in a data center down in London. Um, and it turned out that people didn't really want that. They didn't want the overheads and the costs associated with it. And the base benefits for that level of redundancy just weren't there. Um, we, our, da we're, our racks are inside a very modern, very secure data center pretty much a meteor strike has to hit the center of Manchester for us to have a major problem in terms of catastrophic redundancy failure uh, at which point as we all work in the center of Manchester we've got an issue too and we might not be responding to support tickets and most of your customers probably wouldn't notice anyway because <laughs> they wouldn't be there they're, and they're, they're also, kind of dark, yeah. so. <laughs> Exactly, but you can sort of see where I'm going. Um, that said, we do realize that obviously uh, customers in the States, in Australia, in Germany, that we might not be the perfect solution for them because of the, having a single data center. We have looked at alternatives. We've looked at, um, we have looked at in, in the past at uh, opening other, day, in other locations of uh, peering against uh, other hosting companies, for example, but it's very hard to do. Um, if you don't scale quickly and at vast cost, then it's not going to work and become cost effective for you. So uh, that or take the VC funding route and pray that someone buys them out as quickly as possible. Which a couple of the uh, the smaller uh, managed WordPress companies are. I've seen some amazing offers where they're offering hosting at sort of five to forty-five dollars a month, and you're there going, you know, it's costing you more to run the infrastructure you're just praying someone's going to come and bail you out before you go bust. Um, so we could have gone down that route, which we, we've chosen not to. Um, K4SP has been around for 16 years, so they've gone through the rough times and the good times. Uh, and we will eventually be cloud-based and all the way around the world because that's the way all hosting is going. So we'll be dragged there kicking and screaming. But actually, for a lot of our customers, they really like the fact that we can actually go and say, hey, look, here's a rack, here's some hardware, and put it in. 
I've got a lovely photo of me installing uh, WordPress VPS2. Obviously, it was completely staged uh, because I didn't go and install it. But it's basically the, a physical piece of hardware that's going to um, have another 700 people's sites on it or whatever. Actually, it's not. It's about 125 people's sites. And it's me putting it in the data center. It's like, look at that. That's our hardware. It's got a little label on it that says WordPress VPS2. How proud am I? And I actually vaguely felt proud until I remembered that this was a photo shoot and actually it had been running for a couple of weeks around the corner. And this was just a label we were sticking on some old piece of hardware. But we can do that sort of thing. And obviously, I, at the same time, I did go and have a quick look and sort of rub the side of the, set of the server and went, good, good server. Well done for car carrying on working so well. I was thinking that, obviously. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that... that um that you've been working with the JSON API for an, any number of years. How does, I guess, how does the API infrastructure getting into core change your workflow? Um, so back years and years and years ago, there was a plugin called the JSON API, mm -hmm. which was the done by a guy from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Modern Art in New York, I think. Mm -hmm. Museum of Modern Art. Yes, in New York. Um, and we, the very first time I came across this was about five, six years ago. And I was actually looking at extending your members of the membership software to provide a REST API. Came across this and went, wow, that's amazing. I build out on this. We can do, we can, it's already got all the things into extend. We can just write a new class that would be wonderful. Then realized we have to get people to install this other plugin. And then we needed to work out a way of authenticating. And then it, oh, and we started building all these dependencies in. And WordPress isn't very good with dependencies. Dependencies is a, a word we don't use. We just throw stuff and hope it works. Um, then the Summer of Code project occurred. Um, Ryan, who um, I think really does deserve a massive shout out because uh, you know a lot of the certainly the initial code was well all of the initial code was Ryan's. It's been worked on by lots of developers subsequently, but you know he has been a massive driving force, um, and he kept he, his project came out, it started to look like it was going to go into core, started looking at it and thinking, oh, you know, this is quite good. But it didn't actually have the extendability that we were interested in at the time. This was sort of three years ago. Over the next few, year, few years, it's completely developed. Um, once people like Rachel got on board um, and Joe from Humane came on board a bit more, they, it started to really feel like something that was really polished but still is this separate plugin. And I started realizing, actually, the more I was working with it, the more I wasn't using the endpoints. So where we've got it in core now, which is in core without endpoints, for me is the perfect position because I, I, the official endpoints have stopped using. At least a, sort of six months ago, I did a project which made, I m must have made at least half a dozen to a dozen uh, end, of, of my own endpoints and didn't use any of the official well, the official ones that were in the plugin at the time. Um, so I don't know where, I, I think the, the fact is in the core, the fact you can create your own endpoints, the fact you can do all these amazing things, that just simple stuff like making Ajax requests is now super simple uh, and very easy to do. It's brilliant and amazing. Uh, and it can be extended out to anything. The bit that I'm actually not that bothered about is what's coming in the next version, which is the official endpoints, which are very much, meh, some people are going to use them, but I actually suspect we're going to find their usage is quite limited, and, and most people will end up putting their own things, which in itself becomes a problem, because while we have namespacing and versioning inside the REST API, it's very much people have to opt into doing that. And we're so good as developers at making sure that we, we do things properly, <laughs> especially when it comes to WordPress. Uh, so there, is, there are dangers ahead. There are worries ahead. But it being in core is a good thing, if only because it reduces down the dependency of that one extra plugin and takes away what is otherwise a quite a scary dependency. Uh, and it also means that it stay, you know, if it goes into core, people rightly or wrongly believe things are stable because they're in core. Um, which means you can take it uh, to projects where there are people who are nervous about working on things in beta or worried about where something is going. And you can say, look, this is, bit, this is in core. This is battle-tested and hardened. 
we can use this. Um, so it will, if nothing else, massively speed up adoption, partly because it's there, but mainly because it, it's got that stamp of approval. And that's got to be a good thing. I think the main thing that having official endpoints is going to do is it's going to cause a lot of themes to be made that are util utilizing those core endpoints. And like you said, it's a small subset and very rigid in its functionality, but at the same time, themes should be well-defined in what they're doing. So I, I think, yeah, this is like the Wild West of the API where you not super wild, but we can go and be creative, the creative West, and, uh, you know, make whatever we want, which kind of sets the bar for what people will do in the future, right? Because right now there are no expectations, so we get to set our own pretty much. I like yeah, that. I think that's a fair statement. I, I like that. I think it's got, uh, the creative West is probably a ni nice, uh, nice way of putting it as well, because I don't think it's wild yet. Um, I could easily see a, in a few years' time as everybody looking back and going, oh, my God, why did we not think about how we were going to standardize namespaces and, and how, why did we not enforce net versioning properly? Why did we just leave it loose? Um, my, my big concerns for the API are nearly all you know, things like security. Um, we already have problems with the XML RPC being uh, regularly used as a, a nice exploit point. The REST API is effectively the same, if not worse, because people will be actually using it. Um, so actually working out legitimate versus illegitimate traffic is just going to be a complete nightmare. Uh, that's obviously me putting a, a, a security hat on. But the possibilities are amazing. I mean, I, I was writing a plugin the other day that just does a ping check. So um, I wanted to make sure that a site was up, so I made a REST API endpoint called ping. Obviously, namespace correctly, but it was effectively ping. And it returns a 200 packet with some basic information about the server and the response times for various bits. Really handy. It took me about five minutes to do. You're a champ. Um, the tool that was making the curl request. Hmm? I said you're a champ. Yeah, I was quite chuffed. But it's dead easy to do, is the point I was trying to make, because that was effectively uh, adding a. a, a might put the endpoint, which is a couple of lines of code, and then it was two functions to hook into that endpoint, and that was it. Um, the whole plugin to do that was something like 42 lines of code. And most of that was because I was being good and making it look pretty. Um, it probably was 48 if I include the comment where I said, this is silly, why am I leaving a comment? <laughs> so I think what... So in one of the future version of WordPress, versions of WordPress, it looks like we're going to get the ability to do HTTP calls in parallel. Do you think that's going to have a big effect on the API and adoption of it? Um, so the way that the WP HTTP library works at the moment is it makes a single request and single receive. Uh, putting it into parallel does help slightly. I, I wrote um, about a six months, nine months ago, a little um, theme that used hack, which is HHVM's own interpreter, and it used hack's async curl request. So basically it was making asynchronous curl requests to create the theme. And all I was really doing was making calls to posts uh, and comments and bringing them back. And then I was rendering them, on in, uh, rendering them PHP on server side back in. Reduced down the number of calls that it was making to the database slightly because of the way the caching was set up. That was really cool. I don't think it would actually improve the adoption of the API, REST API because I think they are two separate things. And I sadly don't think most people see the benefits of using the REST API yet with anything other than the latest shiny JavaScript. Um, hopefully that will change over time because obviously it's a REST API. It can be called with just about anything. And in fact, you know, humble curl hopefully will be seen around the place, or curl, or whatever you want to use. Um, but yeah, it would be uh, as a side, the, the changes to the WP uh, WP HTTP library is really cool. And I'm, again, it's another Ryan-based thing. He, so. he is our he, he is the he is the champion in this again. Um, it's based on his requests library, yep. I think. Yeah, Nothing him wrong. and Scott but had yeah. a lot of reports. Uh, Scott Taylor, it, I'll link the ticket number, but it, it was really interesting because there already are implementations. A lot of what's been holding it up, I think, has been backwards compatibility as usual. <laughs> uh, 
So. But yeah, no, I, I, I look forward to seeing it because it's going it, in core. Um, as I say, I've been doing something similar but different with um, HSBM's async. Uh, there are. Uh, it'd be quite interesting to see something. Um, some of the more modern uh, HTTP libraries that are available for PHP may be integrated in. Mind you, requests is a modern one, so I suppose we've, I'm getting my wish. Though it's still 5.2 compatible, I think. So mm -hmm. not using all the groovy new features. Never mind. <laughs> all right, so so we're all moderators on um, managewp.org. I'm curious your thoughts on the on the community there. Ah, uh, that's an interesting, that's a good, nice curveball. Um, do we have a community? That's harsh. No, that that, that sounds really harsh. Uh, I I really uh, so uh, for years I've wanted to have a, a community space where people could share good URLs and really interesting high quality articles about WordPress and associated development and mainly because you know I'm lazy. I want to actually other people to find me the stuff that I have to read. I don't want to go hunting it out from hundreds of sources. And ManageWP came around at .org came around just at the right time, which was just before I decided that no one was ever going to do this and I should write it myself. So it was and it was perfectly timed. Um, and so I jumped on board. And Vladimir is a lovely guy, um, and he's tr he really is trying to create an amazing community. The problem is that the way that it's set up at the moment, there isn't that much of a community be there because people go to dump the link, find links, and then go away to go and read them. So the comments don't really happen unless it's, this is broken, or worse, this is nice, or <laughs> great, and similar comments, which you're just going, go away. Um, it's also had, it's starting to reach that point where there was a, a few months ago, we had, there was that bit about... What is a what is a WordPress article? What's not? And it, it it can be really hard to moderate. And for a long time, Vladimir was doing it by himself. And I I have admin rights. I can log in and I remove some of the worst offending stuff in the mornings. And I but I try very hard not to be to use that privileges too much because uh, I realised little power might be a bad thing, and I might start getting very dictatorial and go, "No, that's a listicle. No, no, no," and I'll just delete everything. We'll be sitting there, and basically, Carl Alexander will be the only person who ever gets a blog post up on there. If I had my way, I think it should be a bad thing. Yeah, I, I tend to be very harsh with leaving comments on listicles. Uh, that conversation that occurred a couple months ago, though, that led to the pro category which I think is kind of interesting, because that's those articles that aren't specifically WordPress but beneficial to the WordPress community and WordPress developers. Though the category itself has had a very low submitting rate. I mean, as one of the moderators... There must be a level at which people are scared. Yeah. Uh, also, 90-plus percent, I think, gets submitted as community, because that's the default category. So unless someone is going in there and retagging it, for the most part, everything is going to be community. Yeah, there's a couple of articles that yeah, I've, I mean, I've wondered if it should be in community or pro, you know? And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, it mentions WordPress, so I guess it should be in the community. If it doesn't mention WordPress, then it should be in pro. At least that's kind of my <laughs> my view on that. I don't know, you know. Or it should get deleted if it's like a stock well, photo sharing site. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, if I had my way, everything would be deleted. <laughs> yeah. but, there, there, I, but that's the beauty of it being a community. I mean, there was a lot of discussion on whether we should allow down votes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, and it will grow. Um, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of members, and if somebody's site is actually published on the front page, they get a fair amount of traffic from it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a, mm -hmm. a level at which people are... I know people who write articles and think, well, I want to get this on Manage WP. I know they won't take listicles, so I'll write my article in a way that's not a listicle, and that's got to be a good thing. Because yeah. it's they're actually spending more than five minutes writing the article. It's got to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they're thinking more about adding actual quality, then that's a benefit to everyone, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
be nice if we had a little bit more interaction, though, I think. I, I Occasionally, I will go in and just do a, a random discussion that says, how's your week going, or similar. Mm -hmm. And they very rarely get more than about four people taking up on it. But it's just something to try and spark a conversation. But those conversations are happening. They're just happening in different places. And maybe Managed WB isn't even a place to have a conversation. Maybe we should just get rid of the comment section altogether. We didn't and originally have it either. Just sort of appear. Yeah, I mean, it took a while for comments to become a thing. Um, the discussion was always there, but they were separated away, so you could either start a discussion or have a link. I don't think you, there weren't comments on links until quite, well, a few months after it started. But uh, unfortunately, it was one of those things that I, when I started, I went, oh, I can game this. Uh, and it, it only took about um, two or three, <laughs> yeah, it only took about two or three WordPress releases for me to realize, to get into the top couple of uh, people in terms of both karma and vote strength. And then in WP Tavern, and I was away. It was terrible, which unfortunately meant the first time I spotted somebody else doing it. So it's like, nope, now I shall talk, write this whole thing about how you shouldn't game the system. Mm. Now I've completely gamed the system and therefore feel like I uh, reached my point. Yeah, don't think, want to be usurped. I think Tom is the top gamer, right? You're still up there, top? Yeah, I'm number one. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the highest vote strength on the site. I decided at some point a couple of years ago that if I started writing regularly, it would be worthy for my articles to automatically go in that number one slot. So it's, since I now have the highest vote strength out of anyone on the site, if I submit an article or upvote an article, it's guaranteed that it's going to go on that front page and very high on that front page. I mean, there, there are some intricacies like what time I post it and how many other posts have gotten submitted within the time period that I'm submitting it in, but I'm pretty much guaranteed to have something on that top top three. Uh, see that? I mean, that's that's it's it's not it's a good thing. I mean, I know certainly when I in the past submitted things, it's it goes popular instantly well, and the, the the thing is, homepage, But it's um. In, in order to get to that top spot, I had to submit a lot of quality articles and contribute positively to the community. It's not like I just found some bug that allowed me to go and skyrocket my vote count. I had to go and contribute quality to the community. And I kind of like that, that even if you just submit an article, which technically that's adding to that community, you're actually, your, your karma points will actually go down. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that, because it, it kind of says, OK, well, I'm not just going to submit 50 articles into this thing, because then you'll have zero. You know? yep. Yeah, I think they did a good job with the gaming mechanics on there. I mean, maybe they could become a little bit more complicated over time to handle certain cases where things could get handled, you know, um, dealt with better. But for the most part, that mechanic that you're talking about with if I submit a low-quality article is taking points away from me if no one else upvotes it. So that, that kind of mitigates garbage. So anyway, yeah, I think it's not a bad system. Yeah. That was the end of that. But I was going to say, I also haven't realized I haven't actually submitted an article for like six months, maybe four months. Have I've you written articles in the last six months? Yeah, I just, oh no, I, I made a point of very rarely submi submitting my own articles. That feels like I'm gaming the system. It's frowned upon in the rules. <laughs> just like listicles. I think I wrote that. <laughs> I think I wrote that too. <laughs> yeah. But we could just have a like an inside network of I will submit your articles, you submit mine, Jason submits someone else's. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, no, that won't happen. That'll be wrong. <laughs> so we're over an hour now, so we should probably close up since people might be falling asleep. Though I don't think they are, but everyone should go eat dinner, or in your case, go to bed because yeah. it's late for you. Yeah, it's 20 past 10. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. If only I didn't have a 5 o'clock start. Yeah, it's not, it's a, I do have a 5 o'clock start, but it's 20 past 10. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find you online? Um, you can find me on Twitter with at tnash. Um, you can find my website, timnash.co.uk. It's not being DDoSed. It's a wonderful site. You should definitely go to it. It has a REST API course on it. Um, that's the only plug you can get, and uh, you can also find well, you can find my lovely employer, uh, 34sp.com at 34sp.com. Um, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me by email, tim.nash at 34sp.com. I'm always available by email, 
and Twitter. Though Twitter less and less these days. I still pop on once a day or so. How about you, Jason? Uh, I'm at Res, just about everywhere. And how about you, Tom? That's three Zs, right? Yep, three Zs. Cool. I am Tom Harrigan on Twitter. Uh, and you could subscribe to our podcast at wpdubtable.com slash subscribe. Uh, like, share, subscribe, iTunes, RSS, YouTube, all that fun stuff. Uh, you can get there or via those sites like YouTube. So thanks for joining us, and have a great night. Thanks a lot.